Ashley brought me Nora Roberts' book, Sea Swept, Chapter 8. He decided to get started on poking at Anna, since she was on his mind. Cam left Seth to deal with the last couple of fish on his own and wandered inside. He made appropriate no noises at whatever Grace was putting together over at the stove, then wandered upstairs. He'd have a little more privacy on the phone in his room, and Anna's business card was in his pocket. At the door to his room, he stopped and could have wept with gratitude. Since his bed was freshly made, the plain green spread professionally smooth, the pillows plumped, he knew some of the sheets hanging out on the line were his. Tonight he would sleep on fresh, clean sheets, and he hadn't even had to launder. It made the prospect of sleeping alone a little more tolerable. The surface of his old oak dresser wasn't just dust-free. It gleamed. The bookshelves that still held most of his trophies and some of his favorite novels had been tidied in the overstuffed chair he'd taken to using as a catch-all was now empty and a clue where she put his things but he imagined he'd find them in their logical places he supposed he'd gotten spoiled living in hotels over the last few years but it did his heart good to walk into his bedroom and not see a half a dozen testy little chores waiting for his attention things were looking up so he plopped down on the bed stretched out and reached for the phone Anna Spinelli. Her voice was low, professionally neutral. Neutral. He closed his eyes. The better fan size how she looked. He liked the idea of imagining her behind some bureaucratic desk wearing the tight little blue number she had on the night before. Mrs. Spinelli, how do you feel about crabs? Ah! Let me rephrase that. He scooted down until he was nearly flat and realized he could be asleep for five minutes without really trying. How do you feel about eating steam crabs? I feel favorable. Good. How about tomorrow night? Cameron. Here, he specified. At the house. The house that's never empty. Tomorrow's the first day of crab season. Ethan's bringing home a bushel. We'll cook them up. You can see how the coins, or what you call it, relate, interact. See how Seth's getting along. Accumulating to this particular home environment. That's very good. Hey, I've dealt with those workers before. Of course. Of course, never one who wore blue heel high heels, but... I was off the clock, she reminded him. However, I think dinner might be a workable idea. What time? 6.30 or what thereabouts. He heard the flap of papers and found himself slightly annoyed that she was checking her calendar. All right, I can do that. 6.30. She sounded entirely too much like a social worker, making an appointment to suit him. You alone in there? In my office? Yes, the moment. Why? Just wondering. Been wondering about you on and off all day. Why don't you let me come into town and get you tomorrow? Then I can drive you home. We could stop and I'd say climb in the back seat, but the Veta doesn't have one. Still, I think we can manage. I'm sure we could, which is why I'll drive myself down. I'm going to have to get my hands on you again. <laughs> I don't doubt that's going to happen eventually. In the meantime, I want you. I know, because her voice is ticking, didn't sound quite so prim. He smiled. Well, I don't want to tell you just what I'd like to do to you. I can go step by step. You can even take notes in your little book for future reference. I think we'd better postpone that. Though I may be interested in discussing it at another time. I'm afraid I have an appointment in a few minutes. I'll see you and your family tomorrow evening. Give me ten minutes alone with you, Anna. He whispered it. Ten minutes to touch you. I... We can try for that time frame tomorrow. I have to go. Goodbye. Bye. Please, then he rattled her. He slid the phone back on the hook and let himself drift off into a well-deserved nap. He was waking just over an hour later by the slamming of the front door. Philip raised in furious voice. Home, sweet home. <laughs> Cam muttered and rolled out of bed. He stumbled to the door and down the hall to the steps. He was a lousy nap. <laughs> Napper, whenever he indulged, he woke up groggy, irritable, and desperate. That's for native coffee. By the time he got downstairs, Philip was in the kitchen, uncorking a bottle of wine. Where the hell is everybody? Philip demanded. I don't know. Get out of my way. Rubbing one hand over his face, Cam poured the dredges of the pot into a mug, stuck the mug in the microwave, punched numbers at random. <sighs> I've been informed by the insurance company that they're holding the claim until such thing, such time as an investigation is complete. Cam stared at the microwave. Well, those endless two minutes have passed so he could gulp caffeine. His blurry brain took an insurance claim investigation and could correlate the terms. Huh? 
Pull yourself together, damn it. Philip gave him an impatient shove. They won't process Dad's policy because they suspect suicide. That's bullshit. He told me he didn't kill himself. Oh, really? Sick and furious, Philip still managed to raise an eye on him. Did you have this conversation with him before or after he died? Camp caught himself. But nearly, nearly flushed. Said he cursed again. He opened the microwave. I mean, there's no way he would have. And they're just stalling because they don't want to pay off. <laughs> the point is, they're not paying off at this time. The investigators have been talking to people. And some of those people were apparently delightedly to tell, delighted to tell them the similar de details of the situation. And they know about the letter from Seth's mother. The payments Dad made to her. So, he sipped coffee, scolded on the roof of his mouth and swore. How was it? Let them keep their fucking blood money. It's not as simple as that. Number one, if they don't pay, it goes down to Dad committed suicide. Is that what you want? No. Can't pitch the bridge of his nose. Try to leave some of the pressure that was building. He lived most of his life without headaches and out seeing he was plagued with them. Which means we'd have to accept their conclusion, or we'd have to take them to court to prove he didn't. And it'd be one hell of a public mess. Struggling to calm himself, Philip sipped his wine. Out of the way, it smears his name. I think we're going to have to find this woman, Gloria DeLightner. After all, we have to clear this up. What makes you think finding her, talking to her, is going to clear this up? We have to get the truth out of her. How? Through torture? Not that it didn't have its... Not that it didn't have its pill. Besides, the kid's scared of her. Came at it. If she comes around, she can screw up the guardianship. And if she doesn't come around, we might never know the truth. All the truth. He needed to know it, Phil thought, so he could begin to accept it. Here's the truth as I see it. Came slim his mug down. This woman was looking for an easy mark and figured she'd find one. Dad fell for the kid, wanted to help him, so he went to bath for him, just the way he did for us. And she kept hitting him up for more. Figured he was upset, coming home that day, worried, distracted. He's driving too fast, misjudged, lost control, whatever. That's all there is to it. Life's not as simple as you live in it, Cam. You don't just start in one spot and finish in the other as fast as you can. Curves and detours and roadblocks. You better start thinking about them. Why? That's all you have ever think about. And it seems to me we're ended up in exactly the same place. Philip let out a sigh. It's hard to argue with that. So he decided to take a glass of wine with him. Whatever you think. We've got a mess on our hands. And we're going to have to deal with it. Where said, I don't know where he is. Around. Christ, Cam, around where? You're supposed to keep an eye on him. I've had my eye on him all damn day. He's around. He walked to the back door, scanned the yard, scrapped when he didn't see that. Probably around front. Oh, we're taking a walk or something. I'm not keeping the kid on a leash. This time of day, he should be doing his homework. You've only got to watch him out for him on your own a couple of hours after school. It didn't work out that way today. There's a little holiday from school. He hooked? You let him hook? When we've got social services sniffing around? No, he didn't hook. Disgusted, came to him back. Some little jerk at school kept wrestling him, poking roses all over him, called him son of a whore. <laughs> Philip's stance shifted immediately from mild annoyance to righteous fury. His guilt glint eyes glittered in his mouth. And, what a little jerk. Who the hell is he? Some fat-faced kid named Robert. Seth slugged him. They said they were going to suspend him for him. Hell they are. Who's the hell's principal now? Some Nazi? Cam had to smile. When push came to shove, you could always count on Phil. Sure, it didn't seem to be. After I went down... After I went down and we got the whole story out of Seth, she shifted ground some. I'm taking him back in tomorrow for another little conference. Now, Philip Grin, why don't we... You... Cameron, kick-ass Quinn, is going in for a parent conference at the middle school. Oh, to be a fly on that one. You won't have to be because you're coming, too. Philip swallowed wide. He's sleep for sure. What do you mean? I'm coming. And so is Ethan. Kim decided on the spot. We're all going. United front. Yeah, that's just the way it's going to be. I've got an appointment. Break it. There's the kid. He spotted Seth coming out of the woods with foolish beside him. He's just been falling around with the dog. Ethan ought to be along in a minute, and I'm tagging him... For this deal. Philip scrawled into his wife. I hate it when you're right. We'll all go. It should be fun. Morning. Satisfied Cam gave Philip a friendly punch on the arm. We're the big guys this time. And when we win this little battle with attorney, we can celebrate tomorrow night with a bushel of crabs. Philip's mood like April Fool's Day. Crab season's open. 
Oh yeah, we got fresh fish tonight. I caught it. You cookie. I want a shower. Kim Rose, Miss Finelli's coming to dinner tomorrow. Uh huh. Well, you what? Philip World is Cam. Cam stared out of the room. Sir, you asked the social worker to dinner here. That's right. Told you I like her looks. Philip can only close his eyes. For God's sake, you're hitting on the social worker. She's hitting on me too. Cam flashing. I like it. Cam. Not to put down your warped idea of romance, but use your head. We've got this problem with the insurance company. We've got a problem with set the school. How's that gonna play to social services? We don't tell them about the first and we give them the straight story on the second. I think that's gonna go over just fine with Miss Spinelli. She's gonna love it that the three of us went to stand for a set. Philip opened his mouth. Reconsidered it on it. You're right, that's good. And as the new thoughts began to play, he angled his head. Maybe you could use your influence on her to get her to move this case and study along. Get the system out of our hair. Can't set nothing for a moment. The president all angry. Even the suggestion of it made him. So his voice was back. I'm not using anything on her. And it's going to stay that way. One situation has to do. Has nothing to do with the other. Let's stay in that way too. When Cam started off, Philip pursed his lips. Well, he thought. Wasn't well, that interesting? As Ethan guided his boat through the dock, he spotted Seth in the yard. Beside Ethan, Simon gave a high, happy bark. Ethan rolled his fur. Yeah, fellow. Almost home now. Well, he worked the sails. Ethan watched the boy toss sticks for the pup. There had always been a dog in this yard to chase sticks or balls to wrestle in the grass with. Remember Dumbo? The sweet face retriever he'd fallen mad in love with when he come to the Quins. He'd been the first dog to play with, to be comforted by in Ethan's life. From Dumbo, he learned the meaning of unconditional love. Had certainly trusted the dog long before he trusted Ray and Stella Quinn, or the boys who became, who became his brothers. He imagined Seth felt much the same. You can always depend on your dog. When he come home all those years ago, damaged in body and soul, he had no hope that his life would really change. Promises, reassurance, decent meals, and decent people meant nothing to him. So he considered ending that life. The water drawn him even then. He imagined himself walking out into it, drifting out until it was over his head. He didn't know how to swim then, so it would have been simple. Just sink it down and down and down until there was nothing. The night he slipped out to do it, the dog would come with him, licking his head, pressing that warm, furry body against his legs, and Dumbo had brought him a stick, tail wagging, big brown eyes, hopeful. The first time he threw the stick high and far, and in a furry, in a fury, the Dumbo chased it happily and brought it back, tail wagging, threw it again, then again, then a dozen of times. Then he just simply sat down on the grass, and in the moonlight cried his heart out, clutching the dog like a lifeline, the need of in need to end it had passed a dog he's a dot now as he rubbed the hand over simon's head could be a glorious thing he saw seth turn catch sight of the boat there was the briefest of hesitation and the boy lifted a hand in greeting and with the pup raced to the dock secure the lines mate aye aye seth handed the line handled the lines ethan tossed out completely enough slipping the loop over the post cam said how you'll be bringing crabs tomorrow did he Ethan smiled a little, pushed back their full cap. Thick brown hair tickled the collar of his work stanger. Go on, boy. He murmured to the dog. He was sitting, vibrating in place as he waited for the command to abandon the ship. With a celebration of a bark, Simon leaped into the water and swam to shore. As it turns out, he's right. Winter wastes. Winter wasn't too hard and the water's warming up. We'll pull in plenty. Should be a good day. Leaning over the side, he pulled up a crab pot that dangled from the dock. No winter hair. Hair? Why would there be hair in an old chicken wire box? Pot. There's a crab pot. If I pulled this up and it was hairy, full of blonde seaweed, it's mean the water was too cold yet for crabs. Seen them that way nearly into May. That there's been a bad weather, winter. That kind of spring is hard to make a living on the water. But not this spring, because the water's warm enough for crabs. Seems to be. You can bake this pot later, chicken necks, or fish parts to do the job fine. In the morning, we may just find us a couple of crabs sulking inside. They fall for it every time. Seth knelt down, wanting a close look. That's pretty stupid. They look like big ugly bugs. I guess they're bug dumb. Just more hungry than smart, I'd say. And Cam says you boil them alive. No way, I mean no. Search yourself. Me, I figure I'm going through about two dozen come tomorrow night. He let the pot slip back in the water, then leaped expertly from boat to dock. Grace was here. She cleaned the house and stuff. Yeah, 
Can you imagine the house would smell like League of Lemon? Grace's house, I always did. Camp kissed her right on the mouth. He should stop walking. Look down at Seth's face. What? <laughs> Smackaroo! It made her laugh. It was like a joke, I guess. Like a joke. Sure. He chugged and ignored the hard, sick ball in his gut. None of his business who Grace kissed. Nothing to do with him. But he found his jaw clenched when Cam, air dripping, stepped out of the back porch. How's, how's the crab business look? It'll do. Ethan said shortly. Cam lifted his bros as a tone. What? Then one curl out of the pot early and up your butt? I want a shower and a bear. He said move past him and into the house. Woman's coming for dinner tomorrow. That stopped Ethan again, and he turned, keeping the screen door between them. Who? I don't know, Spinelli. Shit. Was Ethan slowly coming as he walked away? Why is she coming? What does she want? Panic rose up inside Seth like a fountain, spewed out in his voice before he could stop it. She's coming because I asked her that she wants a crab dinner. Cam tucked his thumb in his pockets, rocked back on his heel. Why the hell was he the one who always had to handle this white face fear? I figure she wants to see if all we do around here is fart and scratch and spit. We can probably hold off on that for one evening. You gotta remember to put the toad seed down, though. Women really hate when you don't. They'll make it a social and political statement if you leave it up. Go figure. Some of the tension ease out, Sophie. So she just like come in to see if we're slobs, and Grace cleaned everything up, and you're not cooking, so it's mostly okay. I'll be more than, it'll be more than mostly if you watch that foul mouth of yours. Yours is just as foul. Yeah, but you're shorter than I am. I don't intend to ask you to pass the fucking potatoes in front of her. Seth so snorted at that and his right, hard shoulder like, Are you going to tell her about that shit in school today? Cam blew out of breath. Practice find an alternative word for shit just for tomorrow night. Yeah, I'm going to tell her what happened in school. And I'm going to tell her that Phil Eason and I went in with you tomorrow to deal with it. This time all Seth could do was me. All of you? You're all going? <laughs> That's right. Like I said, you mess with one Gwen, or you mess with them all. It shocked and appalled and terrified them both when tears sprang to Seth's eyes. They swam there for a minute, blurring that deep, bright blue. Instantly, both of them stuck their hands in their pockets, turned away. I have to do something. <laughs> Sam groped. You go, wash your hands or whatever. We'll be eating pretty soon. <laughs> Just as he worked up the nerve to turn, then lay a hand on Seth's shoulder. Say something. That would undoubtedly make them both feel like idiots. The boy darted inside, rushed to the kitchen. Cam pressed his fingers to his eyes, massaging his temple, dropping his own. Jesus, I've got to get back to a race. Want to know what I'm doing? <laughs> he took a step toward the door and stood. His head walked quietly away from it. He didn't want to go inside with all that emotion. All that need rolled in the air. God, what he wanted was his freedom back. To wake up, find it had all been a dream. Better to wake up in some huge, enormous hotel bed in some erotic city with a hot, naked woman beside him. When, when he tried to picture it, the bed was the same one he slept in now, and the woman was in him. As a substitute, it wasn't such a bad idea, but it didn't make the rest of it go away. He looked up at the window of the second floor as he walked around the house. The kid was up there pulling himself together, and he was out here trying to do the same thing. Look, the kid had shot him. Cam's out just before things got sloppy. It had stirred up his gut. He had sworn he'd seen trust there. And pathetic. Almost desperate gratitude that both humbled and terrified him. What the hell was he going to do with it? And when things settled down and he could pick up his own life again, that had to happen. He sure himself had to. He could stay in charge like this. Couldn't be expected to live like this forever. Places to go. Races to run. Risks to take. Once they had everything under control, once they did what needed to be done for the kid, got this business Ethan wanted to establish, he'd be free to come and go as he pleased again. A few more months, he decided. Maybe a year. When he was out of here, no one could possibly expect more from him. Not even himself. End of chapter 8.